I'm just gonna see how this all goes. I'm gonna put one hand in to make sure that the binky doesn't fall out. Fair enough. Now, have you gotten too used to the fact that people just don't care about you and only care about the baby now? Uh, yeah, it became pretty clear the second my mom visited us the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Past Podcast. I'm Casey Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Sam Alisea. Hi! Uh, and even though this is one of our bonus episodes, we actually have a guest with us today. Uh, we have my baby, Grace. Hi, Grace! Yay! <laughs> So, Sam, this actually seemed like a perfect episode for us to have a uh, an intruding child with us, uh, <laughs> because this is one of the early episodes of the show that we are talking about today. Uh, we're looking back at the episode I did with John Broughton, executive producer for Starship Farragut, discussing Star Trek The Motion Picture. And while I had a great conversation with him, uh, he has a couple of kids and his, his youngest son... Uh, <laughs> just kept on uh, uh, barging in on us quite a bit during the recording, which led for me uh, to have a very, like, chopped kind of episode. Uh, Like, you can really hear, like, very abrupt transitions in conversation uh, when you listen to it. Yes, definitely. The other thing that I... This will really only affect, like, the tens of people who listen to it first uh, on the Certain Point of View feed. When it first went out, the audio quality was way worse and when we put it, when we split off into its own channel, I went back on all the original episodes because I had learned a decent amount about editing between like the first episode and like the ninth episode and remastered it. Um, so it actually sounds a lot better than I remember because the first version, uh, like our audio levels just like kept dropping. Like there's one or two spots still in this one. Yeah. But it it was way worse in the original wow. release. Uh, oh uh, and yeah, it's, it's not uh, too, too bad. It's a little, yeah, re- yeah, yeah. Re-listening to it, I was like, "Oh, oh, this isn't isn't that bad." Um, and then I, I got to like a spot where like my voice like kind of dropped out uh, because at the time, a lot of the ways that I would like uh, deal with like those kind of audio issues, especially because we were both in the room together, is like like I would uh, like drop the volume on our mics as opposed to just like a hard cut, right? So that uh, and, and like there's lots of other like ways to like kind of like finesse it, but I was like extremely reliant on the like uh the gain line uh, in audition <laughs> and like uh have setting points of like okay now fade out here now f- okay Th- uh, that aside i actually think it like now actually like sounds pretty good overall just like acknowledging that it's still an early episode for the show yeah i thought i thought it sounded pretty good i did notice the, the choppiness and and like you know stops and i was like oh wait but there's also so much knowledge in this episode i feel like in general people will enjoy this and especially if they didn't know tiny facts about Klingons, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I really was excited to have John on because he's such a Star Trek fan. And it, this was uh, this is will be a really interesting episode to like look at in general. But um, it is fascinating to be like, oh, yeah, we were talking about Farragut Forward at this time, too. And like at at the time, it was so fresh after the uh, the Paramount guidelines uh, had had dropped that we thought that it was a project that we had to shelf. Right. Um, and then flash forward to what, like six years later and. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and we're almost done with the production of, of Farragut Forward. We, uh, you know, the, it's a project that had new life and a, a lot of excitement. And so uh, and I've been a part of that. And John's been on here promoting that uh, when we did the Star Trek yeah. episode uh, last year, I want to say. Yeah. It was part of us like actually promoing the uh, the Indiegogo when when that was launching. Yes. Uh, so that's all stuff that we talk about in this episode. Uh, but why don't we get into it? Because I don't know how long I can hold this binky in my daughter's face uh, and keep her from fussing. So <laughs> and right on cue. <laughs> Welcome to Certain Point of Views, another past podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com. Hey, thanks for tuning in, Nerf Herders. I'm Case Aiken, and today I am joined by John Broughton. Hey, guys. Today we're going to talk about Star Trek The Motion Picture, and I honestly could not think of a better person to talk to about it than John Broughton. So, John, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about Starship Farragut, which is how I know you. Well, Starship Farragut is, is one of the oldest fan film series dedicated to Star Trek. Um, We started around 2004, 2005. We've made numerous films, both live action and animation um, and a comic and and some other 
forms of media out there based on the USS Farragut and its crew, which is not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It's Captain Carter, Smithfield, and Tackett. And it's, it's a different ship, different crew, different adventures, but not a parody, serious trek. Um, set in the same original series platform. Yeah, the, the Farragut's a canonical ship, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. appeared a, a couple of times in TOS, and then again in TNG, it, it gets some uh, gets some love. But uh, it was referenced in the 2009 Star Trek movie. Uh, yes, it was. Almost yes, gets put very on it. Deliberate too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's de definitely a love letter to original Trek material, and not just like okay, we're gonna just poke fun at at everything. Right. Right. Um, Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, John, I have to say, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this movie, especially with you, is that I owe you a debt mm. in my love of Star Trek. Uh, I grew up as a Next Gen guy. I like I watched Next Gen and Deep Space Nine and Voyager in high school, and then in college, I kind of missed uh, Enterprise because I just wasn't watching TV that much. Uh, but then shortly after college, I met you and started working with you guys on Farragut, that's right. and that's when I got into like I went back, I rewatched like the original series, I finally watched all the animated series, mm -hmm. uh, made a point of watching all of the movies, uh, and you know really loved it because before that, I kind of I remembered it, I'd watched some of it, I you know I liked it, but but I was like, I'm a next gen guy. Like I, I like Picard. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and really working with Farragut, that's how I I sort of revived my love of Star Trek. Mm. Uh, and me watching Star Trek: The Motion Picture was kind of part of a like a completionist uh, mode for me. I was like, I've got to watch all these movies because I, mm -hmm. you know, right. I, I, like I'd seen Wrath of Khan. I loved Wrath of Khan. It's a great movie, but I'd always heard the motion picture was kind of bad, and I I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. I've heard some counter arguments to it. Let, let's take a look. Well, one, I never knew that about you. I mean, I, I, I've known you, as you said, a long time ago. You were like one of our young kids, one of our pu young pups who came to our project. And, and um, um, very early, you were featured, I think, the first time was in For One of a Nail. Yeah, I had a quick cameo in there. And um, so it's good to hear that through our project, it helped kind of incite you to watch some of the, ink, the earlier work of, of Star Trek. Um, to the point of the Star Trek, the motion picture, and those that may not be familiar with a little background, it was the movie that was made um, 10 years after Star Trek was canceled, which went through many iterations in the 70s, and it went through a phase where <laughs> it was literally called Star Trek Phase Two, and it, was a, it, was, it had a lot of the 70s look and feel woven in the series. And, the plan was initially to bring back Star Trek, um, but to have it as a new television series. Yeah. And after the success, the major unprecedented blockbuster success of Star Wars, Paramount executives said, well, let's, let's push it out as a motion picture. So now the motion picture was a script from the Phase 2 project, right? Uh, was it the pilot? Well, I don't, I'm not for sure if it was one of the pilots. I would suspect not. It was based on a story that Gene wrote called In Thy Known Image, and it was based about meeting God, from what I remember. Um, Star Trek fans don't quote, you know, I mean... <laughs> it's, this is it, not one of the big ones that people, like, talk about a lot. No, it's not. And it's, it's not... I think based on all the scripts that Gene had, and he was involved in the first movie, but he wasn't thereafter, and it was more of a consultant and getting his take on the script, but this was the script that they opted to go with. Right, I mean, this movie, it, it was not a commercial failure. It like, actually is one of the higher oh, no. percentage yeah. return ones of Star Trek movies, but it still doesn't have the sort of uh, love that like the immediate follow-up, Wrath of Khan, did. Correct, uh, correct. And in terms of timeline, when this movie did come out, it did very well financially. However, the people that, after they had seen it, it, the rapport was that, or the consensus was, this is not, this wasn't a great movie. So when they were, you know, two or three years later, when they opted to do Star Trek II, a lot was banking on reusing sets and, and costumes and such. And it was, it was a make or break fail. And had the, the, the script that Nick Meyer had provided and the directorship of that had not been um, executed well, we might have seen an end to all the movies and then the franchise itself. Yeah. Can I tell you a fan theory of mine? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I have theorized that with this movie, especially the way that the shots that we got in this movie, uh, that 
Gene Roddenberry either was holding out hope to do another TV show or to do movies, but with a, a, a tight turnaround and possibly at like tighter budgets in some case. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we get these like crazy elaborate, uh, like long special effects shots. Because that's like classically what you do for like a TV pilot, where you get like, okay, all the special effects that we're gonna need with the ships and everything, we're gonna get those so we can reuse like little snippets of it here and there right. uh, later when we make the next episode that happens to be like, oh, we just need this, a shot of the ship, mm -hmm. or we just need like a, a laser blast right. image, you know, to, to chop it all together. Uh, that's I think an interesting theory. Um, there are, I mean, that's one thing I'm, I'm sure we're gonna talk about is, is the editing and all the footage that is in this film. Um, there's a lot of special effects. And then for the time, for the day, it was, it was quite, um, I, don't, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but it's quite extravagant. It's very yes. nice. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely came in the way, or it came right out after uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. which I think was the thing that really pushed everyone to be like, sci-fi can be a blockbuster. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Star Wars was like people weren't sure if it was going to be like a flash in the pan. No one else cares about anything else. Close Encounters follows up, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Oh wait, people like this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just kids' TV anymore. Like mm -hmm. we can do real movies about it." Uh, and it, it's part of that like golden age of Hollywood, or not golden, uh, bronze age of Hollywood. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's, uh, yeah. So do we want to just dive in? I mean, yeah. uh, all right. So pretty famously, there's the the odd even rule for Star Trek right. movies. Uh, and this movie sort of starts it off. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't fully agree. And I think, I don't fully agree with the larger series having that rule, but I, I get why people say that. I mean, Wrath of Khan is so good and it's so different. Mm -hmm. um, this movie very different, yes. is very much a Roddenberry Star Trek movie. It, yes, it is. It, it definitely is this, um, with the theme of the, the movie, it, it's definitely got Roddenberry all over it. Um, See, I've argued, uh, and I've seen other people make the same point about Star Trek movies, is that they tend for a movie to make Starfleet more militarized. Uh, that's why it's like very military jacket looking in Wrath of Khan and then like that era of Star Trek films. When you get to uh, First Contact, they have like a much more military kind mm -hmm. of look to them. Uh, and then with like the, the new Trek stuff, like 2009, all of, all of a sudden, all the terms are like you have to enlist in Starfleet. It's a peacekeeping armada. Like these terms, uh, making it so military makes it easier to convey this to a broader audience mm -hmm. than for the subtle, subtlety of a movie like this movie, or which is sort of doing the same thing that the TV show did, where it's not exactly a military like ship. It is a ship. It has a purpose. It has a mission. But that mission isn't defense or fighting or... Or anything like that. That that mission is discovery. Yeah, and Robert Wise, who was the director of this film, whose work goes back, um, way back from the 30s, 40s, and then coming up. And he he was started out, I think, as a video editor. He won an award, an Academy, for, I think, award for his work on Citizen Kane. Um, he films that he um, directed that got him a lot of fame. Um, I'm not sure about Gone with the Wind, but certainly West Side Story and Sound of Music, other movies, and some science fiction ones as well. He wasn't he wasn't um, a, a novice when it came to Star Trek. When no, I mean if, he, if he's working on strange. Gone with the Wind and Citizen Kane, yeah, like he, he's, we're talking about a Hollywood pedigree right there. Yeah, and, and some other sci-fi films as well that Robert Wise had directed. Now, when he started working with um, Gene Roddenberry on this, he interviewed. Bill Tice, the original designer of Star Trek, he rejected his work, he rejected another one, another designer's work, and then he met with Robert Weiss. And Robert Weiss was meeting Roddenberry, I think, and I could be wrong about timing, but he was meeting, he came up with the designs for the Klingons, which not many people know about, which yeah. set the standard from 1979 all the way up to all the movies, all the incarnations of, of Trek TV, of Star Trek, all the way up, so from 1979, say, to 2004, 2000 time frame, he set the standard what the Klingons were. Yeah, this uh, this is the movie that brought mm -hmm. out, like, the, the forehead ridges. This is the one yes. that made Star Trek, like, the most recognizable species in Star Trek, th what they are. Like, prior to this, they were the smooth-headed, uh, like, yellow-skinned, kind of cheap aliens 
Like they, they, that's actually what they were. Like they were introduced originally to be a cheap alternative to Romulans, which had the much more expensive prosthetic ears. And and he actually, in terms of the, like you say, the, the ridges and the, it was based on a design that he had for another project. I think that Jack Palace was involved with, and it was more like a lizard kind of creature. And he just, you can see the similarities in his drawings of that image, and what the Klingons, what he, what he pitched, and was what was accepted. Um, but when he met with Bill, Robert Weiss and shared his designs and they were talking, he, like you were saying about the military look, he didn't want to be too overly military. And he said that he did not want a lot of color in the film. Um, so that's why, it, you know, Robert Fletcher was sometimes, I, I, I spoke to him last year and we talked about this. And he said, it, you know, the, the, I mentioned about the monochromatic look of those uniforms um, I, I called him in regards to Star Trek II and the uniforms for that. And it was, we, we started with the reuse of the uniforms in Star Trek, from Star Trek the motion picture to Star Trek II because of cost savings. So they had to repurpose those uniforms. They had to re-dye them, they repurposed them, and those became the enlisted jumpsuits. Okay. Of everything that you saw, and there's, there's plenty of those different iterations of those, those costumes, but essentially, what you see in the motion picture became all the enlisted jumpsuits. And we, he mentioned, I, I, I just said it was such a difference going from the leisure suits of what they look like, these lounge outfits, to these nice military uniforms. And he just, he, you know, it was Robert Weiss that really influenced how the, that military look, that uniform look, which really wasn't a uniform at all. There were so many different colors, and they were all on a monochromatic color scheme, and they had so many different iterations of what Kirk wore and some of the other characters wore that just wasn't consistent. So it, 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 it kind You're talking of, about in two through uh, six? No, in the first iteration, once Star Trek II came about, there was this, this uniform uh, palette that became the standard moving forward. But before that, in the motion picture, it's yeah. all over the place. Yeah, no, this one... it. It doesn't look like there's any sort of like consistent feel, aside yeah. from like some uh, some very minor details from the TV show to this. Um, it's it's interesting thinking about that in relation to the the look of the bridge versus like the 2009 movie where it's like very white and then they they have the classic uniform color scheme mm -hmm. so it pops a bit more but like you get that same sort of very white to represent the future in this movie too. Yeah, the colors the colors of these sets and how the sets are lit. It's very bright. It's very warm in contrast to the other movies after this. Or to the original series where it was very gray. For like, yes, yes. Uh, gray and black were the, the constant scheme of the actual ship with like a few bright colors to indicate like this is a, like, this is a railing or this is a pipe to don't yes. touch it. Like uh, the original series looks very submarine-esque, like very naval, which I, I kind of attribute to so many people who worked on that movie, or pardon me, who worked on the TV, the TV show. show uh, having come from military backgrounds, either in World War II yep. or in uh, Korea. That's correct. Uh, and then you look, and so it all, all makes sense in that regard. And this one is moving more towards, like, this utopian future thing that Roddenberry was really pushing. Right. Uh, with, like, bright colors and no no device, or, like, much more futuristic-looking jumpsuits and uh, lots of lots but of interesting sets, choices. The sets on the motion picture, though, they had a lot of money to spend with, so they went all out, and they're very nice, Oh yeah, I mean, the functionality of the sets and and how they, in contrast to the original '60s Trek, which was TV. This, I mean, you had Alien come out around the same time as this movie, and so that that realistic, more modern feel. Like th these look like real sets, so that believability aspect went up. Yeah, the and, the the lived-in future is yes. the term for like Alien and and also for Star Wars, like where they have like a worn-down kind of thing. And I think Ralph McQuarrie worked on designs at one point for this, or was it for Wrath of Khan? He was a big designer for Star Wars, uh, but then they, he submitted some stuff for Star Trek that never actually went anywhere. Oh. It's really good that you're noticing all this uniform stuff, because with Farragut, I mean, it's a very hand, all hands on deck, and so you've been responsible for all the costumes, right? Yes, um, the, making the costumes was a necessity. I couldn't make, I couldn't find anyone to make these uniforms, and. My tailor that I saw in the Navy, just he, he wasn't inclined to make them. So I had to learn how to make them myself. And then so deep diving in the research and, and the costumes and such, 
um, that was that was what I was. I hone in a lot. Of yeah, you do. Things. You've done fantastic work. I have. Thank you. Uh, one of yours that no longer fits me that was of the velour original look oh, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wore it to a poker tournament once and I was just kicking ass because people were like I know you have a great hand right now but I can't take you seriously right now I have to call <laughs> <laughs> the only problem was it was too hot and I started I had to take I had to change and nice. all of a sudden like my winnings just like ripped away from me <laughs> that was the the shift there so yes the movie looks beautiful and that actually kind of leads me to my big note about this movie which is learning to edit. Uh, the whole thing is gorgeous, and it's a true Star Trek piece, but it is so slow. Yeah, the, 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 I think the, the overall problem with Star Trek, the motion picture, is the video edit. It is, it, you can chop this film down to a much more... Um, tighter would be... Tighter, a, a tighter flow of the whole story that makes it so you don't lose interest um there you know what i think um, a problem with star trek fan films in general is that the person that usually is doing the edit is usually the camera person or the director and they don't want to cut any of the footage and i feel like with the motion picture it's it's almost like a fan film in in some respects not only about the video edit but a lot of the the story itself has a lot of exposition that is explanation of things well where... and some fanfic -y concepts like V'ger mm -hmm. being Voyager 6 like that feels like a concept that someone who's just pitching a Star Trek idea and like just spitballing ideas yes. that sound Star Trek like <laughs> uh, but that said I don't think that the plot's a bad plot and I think it's a it's a true to Star Trek movie so I don't have like a lot like you might have some different opinions but in my my opinion the biggest issue is just that it takes so long to yes. get to everything yes. and to yes. get to every point. Yeah, you got the, the the beginning sequence of of Kirk and and Scotty getting in the travel pod and going around the the new refurbished Enterprise and all that fanfare that is just way too long. It's like what 15 minutes? Yes. It is so god yes. damn long. <laughs> it is. And then later on when you're going when the Enterprise is going into Vija itself, and you have these exaggerated um, shots of not only what's going on on the outside, but of the characters, the crew members, like looking and their reactions, and it's just it's just way too long. Yeah, and they're they're pretty, they're, like they're beautiful, but they it just takes forever, and the movie just grinds to a halt yeah, every time they have these extended special effects shots that even, like that look great, but just even on yeah, even on the reactions of the crew members, you got like almost like a full minute of Spock, you know, thirty seconds of Ahura, thirty seconds of Decker. I mean, you just need a couple of seconds. Yeah. You don't need all this. It's just way, way too much. And I mean, like we shouldn't, like we shouldn't try to look at it from the perspective of the modern era like the music video style editing that has become uh, characteristic of movie making today. You know, uh, since 2000 and like, we, we've seen a lot of directors who cut their teeth doing either commercials or music videos, uh, getting uh, like bigger movie roles. Or, and as a result, we've seen this like tighter editing become kind of the norm, like this rapid fire uh, style, which has ups and downs, but we shouldn't look at it purely from the context of today where we've gotten used to it, but even movies of that era, like compare it directly to Star Wars. Like Star Wars had big elaborate special effects shots, but they were still much shorter and much tighter. Much, like, much, yeah. Like the he, best he, thing you can say about Star Wars, which is an immediate inspiration for this movie coming out, is that its pacing is perfect. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's interesting that for a guy who directed this film, who got an award for best editing, on Citizen Kane, one of the most revered films of all time, to then make this movie. Um, I, I've seen the director's cut, which came out in 2002 on DVD. When you watch that film, it's actually a tolerable movie. Whenever I watch this, whether as a kid or an adult, I would always fall asleep um, on the film. I can never watch it from start to end. And not only does the director's cut um, work, it, it's actually a good movie. Like, I, yeah. I hated this movie until then. So it's proof that you can make a better movie yes. out of this, like which is why this is great fodder. Yes. Like this is uh, an interesting one because I don't think it's a bad movie. I wouldn't call it a good movie either in its purest <laughs> right. form. But I think that there's all, a lot there that could be a great one. Like the first time someone really had a long conversation with me about this movie, they referred to it as the motionless picture. Other that, pe other people call yes. it the slow motion picture. Mm -hmm. The fact that those are its nicknames is a terrible thing. Yeah. I mean, 
I think my experience working with films, fan films, is that it all comes down to script and story. And it, you can only do so much with what you have to work with. So putting aside that, because I think I agree with you, I think it, it is Trek. It's 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 not probably the best story to tell, but it's not terrible as as well. Um, things there's, a, I think overall my my criticism would be just on the video edit itself that it could be cut down and and you work from that. In terms of there's a, there's a lot of things that I think the the film gets overlooked upon. And that is the way the camera, the cinematography of this film is extraordinary. Oh, it's the, beautiful. It, it, the shots, the framing, the lighting, um, everything is very crisp. And then you go to Star Trek II, which was made a couple years later. And all that footage, a lot of that footage is grainy in Star Trek II, which you, how, you know, moving forward, you think the, the quality um, would be better. But for whatever reason, whether it was just not the aperture and the camera wasn't set right or what have you. But in the motion picture, all the cinematography is well done. The framing, um, directorship, I, I thought was, was executed well. Um, yeah, li listeners, we have a freeze frame right now. We, we had the Blu-ray on before we started recording. Uh, and it's just a shot of Spock uh, in a spacesuit. And it looks gorgeous. Like, that could be a desktop background for my computer. Yeah. Like, every shot looks so good in this movie. Every it's just, shot in the film. There's, they there's just didn't want to cut down on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so we talked about the editing. I think a lot of people have talked about that. It's the biggest problem with this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, just by having it a little trimmed down, you could have made this movie just a much more effective story because you, you would have gotten to your beats and hit those and, yeah. and moved on. Uh, so let's talk about the conflict between Kirk and Decker, because that's probably the most interesting like relationship in this mm -hmm. movie. Yes. yes uh, and I'm so torn about how it plays out because Decker, I, uh, you know, later, later stuff with the actor aside, like <laughs> I really like that conflict, yeah. but I think that the way they wrote it would have been better for a TV show where they then had a chance to resolve their differences and mo move on. Um, yeah. I, I never thought about that. Um, I, I, I liked it, and it, it is very, it has got a lot of um, good dialogue between the two. And I think that the director, whether it was him being able to bring it out of William Shatner or William Shatner just being on point, his acting in this film is actually pretty good. Yeah. My biggest concern with it, uh, because I like that they, they have this adversarial relationship uh, where, like, Decker feels like Kirk is stepping in and, like, kicking him out of his spot. Like, he literally gets demoted. Uh, from captain of a, of like a, oh, the yeah. flagship of the the federation, uh, back down to commander, uh, and I can see that hostility, and that, that's all great. It's very anti Roddenberry. Like famously during the first three seasons of Next Gen, like they weren't allowed to have like interpersonal conflict. They were on, not. Like, and this is yeah. this is right front and center. My problem is that Kirk comes off like a dick, and I don't like that he doesn't seem as well reasoned for his approach. Uh, like, if this was, um, like, the way it opens Wrath of Khan, where he's feeling very much benched and sidelined, uh, and we get a lot of scenes about that, um, and where he, when he takes command of the ship, it's uh, a bit more of a step uh, out of necessity. Yeah. Like, we don't get any scenes before he comes to the Enterprise where we, we see and him feeling like he's stuck and you know what? When as I an think admiral. about it, him coming back, it almost seems unlike Kirk to have that kind of reaction. But to me, it, it came off as something that you, a legitimate behavior um, of, of someone that had something, he let it go, then he wants to take it back, and then just certainly the animosity that, that Decker has, that he projects, it is, you can, it's legitimate. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Kirk's reaction, you're right, I never, I never thought of it. Like, that. let's take the timeline here. So this movie came out 10 years after the show ended. Uh, so that means that if they finish their five-year mission, then Kirk would have been and uh, off of that five-year mission for eight years at this point. Well, in, so if he became time, an admiral immediately after his success leading the Enterprise for the, for that five-year mission, uh, then that means at most he's been an admiral for eight years, maybe even less. He might have had a command of a ship after that. I think I don't, and I think in terms of the lineage. It's not that long. I think if I remember correctly. Oh, is it even shorter? I think it's like five or six years. Oh, that's even shorter. It's, it's, yeah. So it's, that makes it even less uh, less of a he's been off the ship for so long and now he's like desperately reclaiming yeah. it. I mean, I guess if it's 
he's only been off it for a very small amount of time. He can't even imagine someone else commanding it, right. which might be the thing. But it just it seems very different than the professional Kirk that we got in the original series. Mm-hmm. Like I know the reputation is that he's a hothead and that he's a womanizer and that he's like, uh, you know, like this swashbuckling figure. Uh, but he, he in the show he was always depicted as being very professional, like uh, maybe a little cocky at times. But he it wasn't that he was like a loose poker player. He just knew how to bluff. You know, there's a mm-hmm. difference between those two things. Uh, and in this movie, I would have liked to see him kind of stuck in. Uh, hating being like uh, in the administration of Starfleet, like hating that he's doing paperwork when he could, when he used to like, like grace the stars, uh, and like have that be when he gets the opportunity to take a command of the star of uh, the Enterprise again, like he jumps at the chance, mm-hmm. uh, rather than he kind of just jumps at the chance without us really seeing it. But when when Kirk takes over the ship. He, he really doesn't want to take it away from Spock, and it's more about the mission than anything. And, um, and, and there's the, I mean, part of it is that Star Trek II, at this point, he's getting much, much older. Mm-hmm. Like, whereas in this, he's in his, uh, like, early, early 40s versus his late 40s, early 50s. Like, you, the, you, the, the sense of Star Trek II, there's this the huge uh, plot of him feeling his age and feeling right. like his glory years are behind him. Whereas in this one, they kind of do the same plot but it doesn't have the same backing material like they no. don't they have him sort of act that way without scenes to sort of explain it which it's weird that i'm saying they needed additional scenes earlier in the movie considering that this is a movie that i wish they would cut da- cut about 45 minutes out of mm-hmm. like it's just a, a funny dichotomy there mm-hmm. and the, the the part that you said about the administration being in the bureaucracy when he rather be hopping along you know starships um in the galaxy, as they said in the movie, um, that was that was in Star Trek Two. So Nick Meyer really tapped into that that piece that yeah. you were just. I mean, saying. Star Trek Two is basically uh, a do over mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Like yeah, it, yeah, like the uniform switch and everything in this movie doesn't really make sense. Like right. uh, you know, Star Trek Two has this much more militarized, streamlined uniform, and those are great. Uh, and then you could sort of argue that when you get to next gen, that people are like, I kind of miss those retro, multicolored uniforms, and like. <laughs> Maybe it's just like a fad and then everyone goes back to it. The fact that this movie is so famous for like that big glaring flaw, however, I think that sort of is the big thing that I would say needs to be done to make this movie work, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just just tighten it up the because video edit, it, yes. it's just so slow and, and kind of sloppy in that regard. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like, sure, you made a, a glorious shot of circling the Enterprise, but it takes so long and movies just don't work that way. Right, and, and there's many instances. It's it's not only... The, I mean, we have those those examples of the long shots that need to be condensed, like the V'ger, in, going in V'ger and the, the fanfare of the Enterprise. But there's so many other instances as I was re-watching the film today of just cut here or there, cut here and there. And you can you can take out 30 minutes easily of just stuff that would make the film just flow so much better yeah and and make the story make it a really good movie i think the director's edition did a lot of that but even in some of that i I saw places that still could be chopped i think also too the good the positive aspects of this film that in terms of cinematography it was well filmed um and the production value because they had so much money you look in the beginning scene when the um shuttlecraft comes in or Kirk's, you know, shuttle that comes in, and you've got all these people walking about. It really gives that sense of there's a lot of people in this military organization. When people, when Kirk gets the crew in for that rec room scene, and there's all those people that of background actors, um, and and people they they brought in a lot of fans of Star Trek. Um, Chris Doohan, the son mm-hmm. of Jimmy Doohan, is in there as, as well as. His other brother and, and um, Yeoman Rand's son is in there. They, they just flooded that rec room with so many people. So it conveys that this ship really does have 432 people yeah, on board. It, it feels a very so, lived-in ship as a result. Yeah. So the production value with the sets and everything, that's another thing I think gets discounted. Um, or something that re-watching this film made me think, oh, wow, they really had some money on this yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, one thing I, I would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, and was the music. Uh, the fact that all this music eventually gets reused for Next Generation. <laughs> right. But, and that's why it's more famous and what we associate. But that theme is great. Mm-hmm. Like, they don't use it for the rest of the Star Trek, or the original series Star Trek movies. But they did on Star Trek V. They, oh, is it in there? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
that's cool. I actually don't remember that spot, but it still it, like you. It's such a classic theme that now has shaped the way we look at Star Trek yes. music since then. Uh, every every spinoff show has tried to do something kind of similar because it was such a strong theme, uh, and this movie brought it into the first place. Even though uh, it really isn't what it's known for mm-hmm. or, or where it's known right. from. Uh, but it's it's a good thing. I, don't, I wouldn't want to not mention that because it's it's so good. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I can only imagine like watching this movie in theaters, being like, "This is so much better than like like that the mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of cheesy Star Trek theme that uh, was of the original one." Right. Like, well, you know what? When they they did something really good with that music, where they throughout the original series, the composers that they got, they would somehow incorporate the elements of the TOS. That's true. Yeah. Theme. So. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to bash the original theme so much. I just always, in my head, think of the Roddenberry lyrics that he wrote for it. <laughs> okay. uh, and that's only because I had to do that in a, like, when I was, like, an eighth grade choir. Like, we did, like, a TV tribute, and they did the Star Trek one. I'm like, these are horrible. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but, yeah, so that was, that was a cool thing. Well, John, let's, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Sure. Uh, why why don't you talk know. a little bit about what you're working on right now? Okay. Van, um, we're working on an original concept um, when up until the point of the Star Trek fan film guidelines came out, we were working on a new spinoff, the new chapter of Starship Farragut, which was called Farragut Forward. And essentially, right, related to this conversation, it was to take place in the motion after the, um, it, it, you know, the motion picture time frame. So the Wrath of Khan uniforms. Yeah, and, doing those era yes. uniforms, not not this one, right, right. the one piece suits yes. from this. So we were working on that, and then the fan film guidelines came out and. And retooled it to be a new original concept called Vanguard, which is essentially cool. a space navy, and we're working on that. Cool, cool. All right, so not Star Trek in any way, but but similar kind of like space opera kind of thing. Yes, it'll it'll be essentially that a space opera that takes place two or three hundred years. We're being nondescript in terms of exact time frame, but in the future, and it it would be. It, it's something coming out of my head in terms of relating when I was in the Navy. So taking naval elements and Navy traditions of of a um, a fleet of ships, but putting it in the, in the space. That's fantastic. That uh, so it's not a Star Trek series, but it's it's going to be kind of the same uh, energy and spirit, basically. Yeah. Right, right. Um, trying to retool some of the sets and props and costumes that we made, but putting it. Um, a whole different universe, whole different concept, um, and I'm, I've pulled from my own experiences in the Navy and trying to flash, um, flash forward, you know, two or three hundred years, with the Navy kind of being the pivotal point. Fantastic, awesome. Uh, do you have a time frame for any of the material for it? I know, uh, we had talked out, out like before we started recording about uh, a trailer being in the future, uh, so we're looking at like. Sp- like a release of like fall of 2017 for that? Yes, um, the plan is that this summer and perhaps this fall we'll be working to put a five to six minute trailer for the, for the project. And we'll, we plan to crowdfund it. And if we're successful, then we'll make an initial three-parter web series. And if we're then, you know, we get people that want to see more, then we can continue it all. But it is for profit because it is an original concept. So... We're hoping that the fan base of, of of Starship Farragut and the Star Trek fans that want to see some original stuff will will back it. Well, that's fantastic. I hope uh, I hope people get really interested in it and you know check it out uh, as soon as we have like solid dates. I'll be sure to post that myself. Great. It's really going to be cool. Great. Uh, all right. Well, John, thank you again so thank much. You, I really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yes. Um, so, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in next week we're going to be talking about Highlander 2 The Quickening and until then stay scruffy my nerf herders thanks for listening to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast don't miss an episode just subscribe and review the show on iTunes just go to certainpov.com
And we're back. So, Sam, this is always a time for us to have you talk about a movie that you didn't have a chance to, or, you know, because we did 100 episodes before you officially joined the show. So uh, what were your thoughts about Star Trek The Motion Picture? And then what are your thoughts about our pitches? So I I like I like this movie. I, I think that it's I think that like anything from that particular era, I kind of put into it. Like like a ball, like like or like a little jar. It's like um, you know, it was great for what it was, um, and and I think overall, I have like a sense of nostalgia for this film. So I don't know if I would really change it, but I did enjoy both of the pitches that you guys. It was so hard because first of all, both of you were so knowledgeable. Like there's so many like wonderful um kind of is in there and like so much nuggets of knowledge throughout this episode that it's just like oh my god that's amazing um things that i was like oh yeah that, oh yeah that did change from like the show to like you know just things that you wouldn't even actually realize um if you were a casual observer of star trek um but i i'm gonna go no pitch for this because I like how flawed this movie is. And I feel like I can take a pass on this one. Um, I don't they do that really like often. Um, and also it's just like, there's something just so classic about all of it, even with its foibles. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Like with the, with the director's cut that came out, um, like with the Blu-ray release, like it's pretty close to perfect for me like it's not yeah. it's still not entire like it's not without its it, its notes but it is it, it's really close like the the reputation that it had built up mm-hmm. i think is um <laughs> overblown yeah um and, and in part because like wrath of khan especially if you're like comparing those two like is so good right right but, but i also think like you know there's a lot of things that have changed over the years like especially you know like even acting styles and what was considered, what was, you know, on stage. I mean, like you go back and you watch any of those like old Charlton Heston movies. You know, I'm not just talking about Planet of the Apes, but like, you know, Ben Hur and Spartacus and like the even like Cleopatra, like those big giant movies, like Lawrence Olivia was like acting, you know? So I feel like there's all of that involved. And then um I, and then just like the movie is just a great like summation of what what was already the series, right? Like they, they, there's something like wonderful to expose this onto the big screen. And so, yeah, I think with the director's cut and that kind of thing, it's just a fun, it's a fun film. So I'm going to leave it with its flaws because it feels like a movie of its time. And I'm OK with that. Yeah, I stand by my my statement that Wrath of Khan feels like a do over in terms of getting a Star Trek movie out there. Oh, great! Because with Wrath of Khan, like it feels like they just wanted to to get all these emotions out um, to to do this whole like theme of aging, and there is that theme in this movie, but it's just not fully realized yet. Yeah, and so I don't think they even had the language to like articulate how they wanted to make those changes. Um, and I think some of that was the you know. We talk a lot on the show about how, like, if you don't have a budget, like, you have to be creative. And, like, Wrath of Khan was very creative because the budget was tiny on that movie. Like, it's it's a bottle episode versus this big special effects, like, ex- uh, spectacular. Like, I like I stand by my thought that the <laughs> that the movie feels like a pilot episode where they were trying to overshoot the special effect footage so that they could use inserts for future projects. And I think it actually does. Yeah. Uh, so like I, that actually, like, I think holds up pretty well in that regard. Um, but like the, the bulk of the movie is like, yeah, no, this is fine. Like it was a, it yeah. was a perfectly fine script from the phase two project that uh, they converted into a movie script. And that's all fine. It, and it's really funny looking at it from now the perspective of like <laughs> TNG is like this storied institution where we get the theme for TNG here. We have basically the cast dynamic from TNG with like Decker being Riker and like, all you know, all yeah. <laughs> like all these elements that are like, oh, yeah, that's uh, you can see how that all is what they eventually turned into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, 
I mean, I think. But then, yeah. <laughs> well, but but then the thing is, like, <laughs> it is missing that little bit at the beginning, like having Kirk really like feeling like he's being taken yeah. out of action uh, is, is the thing that it's missing because then he acts appropriately for a character who's feeling that way. We just don't get really like good scenes of him feeling that way. Yeah, there's there's no early on like development it's it's like um you know a, a telling and a not showing you know and so whenever you have that you really only need you know a scene to really show something and really like but but it's like when someone's like i feel terrible but there's nothing right. <laughs> you, you don't know why like nothing's there's no nothing to support that you know like so it's it's a poor setup because we it's the expectation that the actor just expressing that feeling or like saying it out loud somehow will make you just understand like make like basically it's like the audience will believe the words that come out of the actor's mouth and it always kind of bothers me when i'm watching shows or movies and you're like they're like oh so that's like let's say it's like a secret sister is like that's your sister it's like yep that's my sister and it's like, oh, we're just believing that person you just ran into is a sister. Like, we're just putting this together. No, no hard. <laughs> like, and and like, I'm like, oh, are they going to discover that they're wrong? Are they going to prove this? And it's like, no, nope. you're just going to take my word that that is his sister. That is his sister. Now we're just going to roll with that. And so it's just kind of that. That's kind of what this happened to hear. Right. It's like, I feel really bad about it, but you don't have those moments of getting the actor to let let you also show not just tell yeah there, there, there's no authenticity in in those kind of scenarios and like you know you just you just kind of see it here again like once the action starts rolling you're like oh yeah okay this is this is right like, like this is right for a star trek movie yeah um it's just i think kind of the lead up again like this is kind of a soft pilot for like whatever future projects they wanted to do with Star Trek. So it's like, all right, let's uh, let's shake it up a little bit. It's a love letter to the original series. It's working off of the phase two ideas that they had been like kind of playing around with and getting some of the cast back and having to shuffle that around. So we get that awkwardness with like Spock coming back when he was written out of the show at that point. Um, yeah. So there's like those those kind of things going on. And then just like, again, there, there's like a lot of setup at the beginning, which is not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they do it very well in Star Trek, too. Um, and you could see it's like, oh, yeah, we the, the audience would be here for it. Now, that said, Star Trek, Two does use a lot of shorthand to get the audience on board for it all. Like uh, we I talk in the episode about the militarization of Starfleet, which is not present in this movie. Yeah. This is really the only movie where that isn't kind of an element. Yeah, that, that that is absolutely true. Because I wasn't when I was listening to the episode, I was like, "Oh wow, he's super right about that." Because it didn't even occur to me. Because I am, you know, I yes, I watched the original series like as a kid, but I really grew up with the Next Generation, right? And so like that was already like very organized, right? Everyone has their their roles and their jobs, and so my introduction to Star Trek, it, it's pretty. It's a pretty organized ship, right? <laughs> well, it's it's always going to be like there's a chain of command. It is like a paramilitary organization, but right. it's it, it the shows always have the room to breathe and be like, oh right, it's a, a scientific exploration and like peaceful ambassador program. Yeah, you know, it's as opposed to they're, they're explorers first, as opposed to like the you know I, I cite the peacekeeping armada line from the 2009 Star Trek, uh, <laughs> which is like just such a you know it's it's such a different vibe. Yes, um, and the the monster maroons I think really start to like push it into that territory. You know, opening with the Kobayashi Maru as like <laughs> like I, and everyone loses the scenario. You know, as great a lesson as that is, like it still starts to move into this like, okay, in combat, what is going to happen kind of yeah, vibe right away. Of, the, yeah. of the series. And that's not in any of the shows. Like even Deep Space Nine, it's them dealing with being forced to be a military group and like the, the you know, the consequences of that. Um, but the shows are, uh, you know, are, are exploration shows. Uh, and the ones that like forget that lesson have to relearn it. Like Enterprise starts with like a little bit more of a military vibe. And then like by the time we get to season four, it's like, OK, we're, we're getting away from that. Right. Yeah. yeah. OK, we're getting away from that. <laughs> oh, we're canceled. Uh, we're canceled. OK. <laughs> yeah, we should we should have we should have backed off immediately. But I kind of understand why they, they try because it's this idea of like trying to hook new people. Right. Trying, trying to kind of like and then 
I realized that the original formula this works best. <laughs> just go, just go back, just go back to what this is because that's that's what people are showing up for. So, like I think beyond, for example, of the newer movies, like that one gets back to being more exploration based, and I think that it hits the best with the fans of the Kelvin verse movies as a mm-hmm. result. Uh, and you and you can see we were just kind of missing that. That, but again, like it's hard to really say in retrospect because we have had so many adaptations of Star Trek at this point. We have so many renditions of yeah. it um, that it's harder to be like upset about all of it. But when you think back to this time, like real, especially thinking about uh, to uh, Wrath of Khan, where like Star Trek had been off the air as a live action show for 20 years at that point. Or not not fully 20 years, but almost 20 years. Right. And then like, you know, the animated show, like while it had its fans is, you know, probably. You know, probably a larger percentage of that is younger people. Um, so people coming in to see the movie, like, needed something to catch them up on it. Like, what what is the deal? If you remember the show from syndication, what is the status quo that you need to care about? Like, where are we now? Kind right. Of stuff. And, you know, like, as much as I like this movie, Wrath of Khan is still the better movie. Oh, 100 percent. Wrath of Khan does everything better. Um you know, maybe, I mean, the, the effects are a little bit bigger in the motion picture. Again, budget things. But Wrath of Khan emotionally, structurally, uh, where it comes to, like, the setup, when it comes to the acting, when it comes to the, you know, the three parts of the film, just all the way through, constri- like, it's just constructed as a much better film. Um, and, and it flows better. And it, it's got... It's got a climax and it's got a great payoff. So like it, it starts off strong too. So like the, the problem with like this movie is that it just doesn't start strong, right? Like not all the parts are equal. It's not a it's not an even movie all the way through. It is there's I mean, I would argue it's not really a movie. <laughs> like it's it, <laughs> That's it's fair. based on yeah. I mean it just in the sense that like the the structure of it, like it's based on the show. It's it's yeah. based it's the show writ large in a lot of ways that's great. And I'm not I'm not complaining about the tone or anything right now because I'm just saying that the the arc of the movie isn't really built around right. Right. a three act structure like a movie. Like uh like teleplays are usually five act structures, I yeah. think, for an hour long. Um it, it, which, you know, sounds like well, whatever, but no, it, it's it's there. And also, like the the nature of like of movie writing is that usually you need to have like a bigger change occur throughout the course of it. Like there is a lot that changes, e- even taking out like Spock's death in Star Trek Two. Spoilers. You know, Wait, what? but even taking that out, like there is a big like through line of Kirk's uh, like feelings as a man in his like late 40s, early 50s. Um, experiencing this world. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the whole, like, he feels old at the beginning and at the end he feels young. And there isn't quite a parallel structure. Like, again, there are those elements there. Like, his relationship with Decker fully realizes that. But mm-hmm. they don't do a lot to support it because this would have been more of, a like, a B-plot or a C-plot that would be existing in a series that was running for a period of episodes um, that got crammed into a much bigger movie. Right. Versus, like... Wrath of Khan is like built up around that idea. Right. Wrath of Khan was written as a movie. It was written as a re- movie. It was written as an actual movie. Right. Yeah. And, and it's not that you couldn't have worked around it. And, and that's why I think like, oh, yeah, like actually punch up the opening a little bit and then tighten all of the extremely long shots. And you would have like a really strong Star Trek movie Yeah. in this. But, you know, as it stands, like it looks pretty good. The, the The director's cut is much, much tighter and as a result, I think addresses most of the complaints people had. It was commercially a success. Uh, it, it was successful enough to get a sequel, even if the sequel was like, fuck, guys, we can't do this amount of money again, even if we made our money back and more. Right. You know, like there's a lot of stuff going into it. And then, you know, like, like one thing. So I had read a lot of like Star Trek behind the scenes books at this point, but I hadn't read um, because it wasn't out yet. The 50 year mission that Ed Gross put together, which is a an oral history of the Star Trek franchise. Mm-hmm. And it is so fascinating. I, I have to recommend that one. I, I'm i a little biased because I was cited in his more recent book, uh, Voices <laughs> from Krypton, which is the, uh, the, the the history of Superman book. Uh, so check that out, too. But yeah, do, check <laughs> that, both of them out. That, that one's coming out this month. Um, and, and I got my copy and it's cool. It's really cool seeing my name in there. But um, <laughs> uh 
but 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 the fifty year mission goes really in depth on uh, everyone's thoughts about the the behind the scenes of Star Trek, um, and it's really interesting with like the birth of the convention scene and like the the <laughs> like the 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 nadir of uh, Roddenberry's career that had occurred post Star Trek, like the, like all of these periods of like real lows and like tension with the writers and tension mm-hmm. with all the producers and trying to see if they had like other, you know, Star Trek was like a f- critical darling, um, but you know, not a huge hit in terms of like money for the studios. Uh, I mean, it drove Desi Lou in, like into the ground, uh, right. which, you know, which, which is, a, a, a weird question of like, OK, if they had made it through season three uh, and not been bought out by Paramount, like what would have happened to the film industry in general? If like, yeah, it, you know, it's just it would have been such a different world. But the also the behind the scenes with like Roddenberry specifically, who, while big, great ideas and like apparently very like personable guy, also hard to work with. And I, I don't mean this in like a su- uh, toxic, like, like, I, I don't mean this in the sense of like he was like directly an abuser, but he definitely had a habit of like filing off everyone else's name and taking credit for things. Like, mm-hmm. infamously, we talk about it in in this episode, the right. uh, the opening credits for the original Star Trek. Like, he wrote lyrics to, even though it was a musical piece and always intended to be a musical piece, so he could get residuals. Yeah, oof. even though they, ne- they didn't use it, and like that's kind of fucked up, and like that's that that's the story of Gene Roddenberry, and like in the seventies and eighties, like he had a, a like a side business of hawking like memorabilia from Star Trek that quote unquote was used on set, uh, and like it, you know they didn't want him around, and that there's a reason he got cut out from the later movies, uh, and there's a reason why he was like like he would push writers away who were like attached to the series and like dearly loved the series uh, because they just couldn't work with him anymore uh, as the the show kept going on and like being a bigger property. And so like, you know, it's hard because like he, he was this huge figure who like inspired everything with it and had this like great vision, but uh, he also was kind of a control freak and uh, you know, like, you know, did, did the whole meme of the like, Hey, I made this. And then like, Mm -hmm. I made this (laughs) like, uh, kind of thing where he would like take credit for other people's work, which like, that's not cool. And no, you not know, cool. It, it's, it's frankly not very Star Trek. Not at all. No, it's, it's, it's the opposite of, of the spirit of the piece that was created. Right. And, and like, I'm not saying that like, if he was a better guy, mm. some of the stuff would have necessarily happened better because it, you also kind of need a person who is looking for th- you know, who has that kind of ego to like drive a project forward, but it's, it's just weird to think about. And it's weird to see like how, when you, when you know a little bit more about like, Oh, like there were some really like hurt feelings between people at all the studios. Like, Oh, I see why this thing was, you know, going to end here or like, why, like why certain actors were like, no, no, like write me out. If we're going to do a sequel, like we, you know, Nemo kept trying to leave. (laughs) I mean, it makes sense. I mean, like, you don't have to necessarily be the worst person in the world to cultivate something toxic. We all have the ability to, like, create unhealthy environments. Um, That being said, yeah, pretty bad. It's pretty bad that, you know, and it makes sense why people would step away. And especially, like, when you're looking from, like, just a fan perspective, you're like, oh, this is great. Why wouldn't you want to be part of this? And then you find out what's happening behind the scenes and you're like, oh, yeah, that that fits. It's two and two together. Yeah. And again, I don't want to be too negative about it all, but but it is it is interesting to see. And this is the movie that Roddenberry actually had his like fingers on. And, you know, you, you can see some areas where it's like, oh, there was no compromise here. There was no making this like work better for like a movie going audience. It was like this is this is what Star Trek is. And we're, we're going to do it that way, which in some regards, great. And so, in other regards, you know, <laughs> like would have been good yeah. for a larger audience to like really latch on to the franchise because maybe we, we would have gotten that sequel sooner. Great. And, and I think that sometimes artists in general and people in general can just get in their own way, right? Because you get so attached to the thing, you know, uh, that you feel like makes this thing this, right? But when you're switching from mediums, I mean, I think I think that happens a lot with like um, 
adaptations of books, right? Like there's no way that you can make a film exactly like the book. There's, there's just, you can't be inside the inner dialogue. There are just, there's more description that you can put in and, and you have to allow the book to become, you have to allow the movie to be slightly different because it just doesn't translate into that different medium. And it's, it's the same thing with like, even like the, the structure of writing for film and TV. Right. And so, and so this, this, like, this is what Star Trek is. And I have this idea and I want, want to see it come to fruition, no matter what, even if it's on the big screen, I'll just make bigger explosions, you know, like that, that doesn't quite um, serve the medium that you're now writing in, right? That doesn't serve the, the story or the, the characters going forward because you have a, a smaller amount of time. I mean, how many times on this show have we said, oh, this should have been a show, right? Like Jupiter Ascending. Right. Or like if that had been a show, like like an actual series, it would have had more time to deal with all the ideas that that they had. Um and, and it would have made for a better story, would have been able to flesh some things out because there was too much in there. Um, I, I think that with here that it's the same thing, right? There's a lot of stuff happening um, that needs to happen, but then you never really get in depth everywhere. And because it's a new medium, it's like, oh, let's play with the effects, which is cool. I get it. It's great. But then some things just kind of get, neglected and left out and that's where you're missing um that emotional drive that wrath of khan definitely has yeah because if you're doing a movie it has to be tight and punchy and if mm -hmm. you're doing a show you can be like long and philosophical and that's why i love that like we we have that now in 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 this era mm -hmm. uh you know like strange new worlds i love i love strange new worlds so much uh, picard season three was such a hit like i mean even lower decks where it's like here's us actually dealing yeah. with like the, the all the weird trivia and the, the silliness of the of the world like uh it's such a great franchise it, it, the, the franchise is, is in such a great shape right now because it, it can do a lot of the things that we that we really want right so like you can see that like that's where its strong suit is and this movie was trying to capture some of that but it just wasn't the right medium for the format that they were doing um and that it needed to be a tighter thing and you can do a philosophical exploration piece in a movie it just you can't it just it, it just needs to be a focused one like the the you have to have like a singular question that you're kind of dealing with right um, yeah. and then addressing it and you know passage of time is a really good one or or just the weariness, like, you know, again, like I cite beyond, I think that's the best of the Kelvin verse ones. And part of that is because it is about a bunch of characters who feel like they have been burned out from doing a job for too long. Mm -hmm. And it's not about them getting older. It's just that the like it's the grind. Yeah. Um, and when when the when the wonder becomes, you know, just labor, mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able to take a step back and like really appreciate that. And like, I think that's a good element there. And like, you know. Sure. Like the best of the next gen movies is First Contact, which is a fighting movie, but it's one that has a lot of like lore and, and stuff to go into it. And that's like really fun for people as a result and deals with like, oh, what is the nature of humanity? Like right. the, the machine man stuff with like data and the Borg and like that. It's cool stuff that they're dealing with. It's, um, and it's got because there's enough going into it. Right. And because we're so familiar with the characters, we already have a little bit of the momentum. I think like with with this film it'd been so long right like or or it'd been a break um and also like that that movie does it so well first contact does it so well where you have like that um the, the one big question that's basically surrounded by all the other stuff right so like it's like it's it's a really good through line of the one big question of what is humanity what what is and then you've got explosions and fighting but it's always asking that question it's done very well yeah yeah and you and you can see that the movies that um are have a harder time getting to that point uh like like nemesis or but mm -hmm. re but really like uh, insurrection which is like very much doing a plot from an episode um but trying to make it into like the movie kind of length is why it kind of like falters and we will talk about that eventually because that's because be we've talked about most of the star trek movies at this point 
so we'll, we'll get to that one because uh, that was a great episode where I had Alex Schmidt from uh, Secretly Incredibly Fascinating on uh, and formerly of the Cracked Podcast. Uh, so looking forward to getting to that one. But that's uh, going to be a while because I was like almost to episode 100 at that point. Very nice. Yeah. So I do want to like address a couple of things that we talk about in it. So it's really fascinating looking at the uh, or like listening to the conversation with John about what we were working on. Again, Farragut Forward, I mentioned the Indiegogo, I think, is actually still technically running. It's like one of those things like we hit our budget or like a while ago. But like it, if we keep getting investments, it'll still like allow people to donate, uh, which is really cool. So as of us recording this in two weeks, they will be filming like the big bridge stuff, like the, the main like Starfleet bridge stuff. I was thinking at one point that I might be able to help out on that shoot. However, I have become very aware now that I'm actually a parent that that is yeah, no. uh, not really like in the cards. But I'm I, I'm going to pop out uh, by set and like actually see everyone, which is hopefully going to be very nice. And I don't know how I, I really wanted to like pitch in some nights, but it's just, man, the the amount of time that you thought you would have. Uh, yeah, no. You being me that I thought I would have. No, uh, no, no. Just way overestimated. Grace is a full time job, bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. As I as I rock her as as we talk. Um, <laughs> fortunately, she's like kind of gone to sleep, um, but it is still going. And there's there's more shooting to be done after that. So the, the bridge set will be the last big indoor shoot. Um, and then they still have the exterior stuff that they want to film because while it is a very tight production, there is a big, cool confrontation on an alien world kind of scene because of course it is. It's a Star Trek. Of course. Uh, so that's, that's coming together really well. The footage has looked amazing. Uh, I was on set for half of the filming so far. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, the la- I, I was there for the January shoot and then the uh, the one in March uh, was like the weekend that Grace was born. So obviously I was not there for that. Right. But the cast is awesome. Uh, the cast and crew is awesome. And they like they they sent her like a child size small, which is still a little too big, but <laughs> a fair good forward uh, crew shirt. And, like uh, like She'll a card signed it. by everyone. <laughs> so uh, absolutely. So fair good forward is like a really cool project. It's uh, it's awesome that that came back together. Um, it. You know, at the time we we thought we were going to try to do something uh, unique and n- not to say that that's not going to happen, but it's it is a lot harder to get the, that kind of momentum for a fan inspired, but like non like original IP kind of project. So we'll see if more stuff happens. But like I like I've been involved in other like non IP related, like but effectively fan film kind of shoots. And some of those like that I shot footage in 2009, I'm still like like sending over ADR for today. <laughs> so like those, the, the, you know, it's, it's labors of love if you don't have like real money behind it. Right. Yeah. But uh, like I said, Farragut Ford looks great. Uh, the preview uh, is out on, if you look up uh, Starship Farragut on, on YouTube, you can find the little like prologue video as well as a lot of behind the scenes videos that are really cool to look at it. You know, I'm really glad that that project, which had kind of uh, fallen off, like picked up again once, uh, once we met Johnny K, the director, who is has such a great eye and did like the oath the Batman fan film which is like now yeah. like well over a million downloads on that one which is is so cool and that's another one that I like was a producer on so really cool stuff happening in the fan space and it's it is a, a space that I really love because as I mentioned in the episode like getting to know the Star Trek fandom got me to go back from being a next gen Deep Space Nine Voyager era fan to like really like digging into the TOS stuff and like really like loving the franchise in you know a totality that I didn't have before, so I do want to keep shouting that out. Like it, it's a project that is currently working or currently underway and like coming together. And by the time this episode get, goes up, because hopefully I'll have this like chopped together pretty fast, we still won't have actually like filmed the like the big bridge stuff. But you know, uh, it's expensive, uh, and so if people <laughs> want to chip in, like it's still an option. If the yeah. Indiegogo did end up closing, because I, I think it's like if someone hasn't donated in like a couple of months, it, it'll shut down. So if it has shut down, um message me and I can tell you how you can contribute. If you live in the Maryland area, would love to have people help out on set. So like I can connect you with people. They're awesome. So check that all that out. I know this is such a, so much more hockey than I normally am. Oh, it's like, okay. I'm fine. Cause as, as a person who did contribute as an investor in the film, I, I would like you to <laughs> encourage people to do the same because I would like to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another part, which is um, when when we recorded this episode, we had wrapped what was the final episode of like Starship Farragut, like the the TOS era stuff. And that series uh, we thought was like, OK, cool, it'll be out shortly. That was a fight to finish. Like that took years to get it all edited um, between a whole bunch of stuff like like uh, the editor 
that we had we were working with having some some health issues that um ultimately has since passed away um mm-hmm. and and like a bunch of other stuff so like the the that took years and normally it was like oh yeah we'll get it out in like about a year after we finish filming ish somewhere in that ballpark and that one was like like five years right uh, so it only finished and came out like shortly before we got fair good forward underway so just <laughs> Just for a frame of reference, like it can take a long time because like it's no one's like job. Um, right. And it's exactly. Hard when that's not the thing. Um, yeah, it's a good segue into being like Writers Guild. Like, hey, you got to pay people money. Otherwise, they're not going to do good work and they're going to have a hard time actually finishing projects. So, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. yeah, go put putting that one out there. One hundred percent. We support we support all the writers. Yeah. Please, please pay them. Uh, for for a show that is as writing focused as we are, like we we want to support those people, yeah, um, because they do amazing work and they they make this this podcast possible. Uh, so yeah, well, they make movies possible, they make shows possible, right. they make all of our entertainment possible. Everything starts with writing. Now we are commercial for the writers' strike. Yeah, Lord knows I do not want this show to turn into like how would we have re-edited like the episode of Real Housewives? Not that I'm bashing Real Housewives, just that like. That is a way weirder kind of conversation yeah. of like, well, if they had gotten the footage from this angle instead of that angle. Like, yeah, I, <laughs> because it's, I'm going to be honest, I don't know enough names, but I really wanted to make a joke of like, I think she should have thrown that water harder. Um, right. <laughs> bravo, 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 D- Denise Richard says. Uh, OK, moving on. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I think that kind of covers all we had to say about this, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, it's really fun to listen back on this one. I Again, I'm like really happy that the audio was better than I remember. It's still not like what I would consider like great. But part of that is just that like literally I think he was five at the time. His youngest son would just like kept walking in and being like daddy and like would like shout a bunch of stuff uh, while we we're like mid take. And so you can like really hear like where I'm able to like chop us out completely uh, and then try to restate it. But like not mad in any way beyond just like right. the, the circumstances <laughs> like kid. Currently holding a baby. Every time she cries, I'm, I'm cutting right now, aside from, like, where I need to for, like, to remind people that that's actually what's going on. Um, so it, it was just a, a rough recording setup. Um, and also, it, it's a reminder that, like, live is way harder than, like, on a Zoom call for yeah. some of this editing. Because, like, when we do kind of cut each other off just because it's a natural flow of conversation but isn't good for podcasts, it's easier to, like, space out that audio when we're not in the room together because yeah. you can hear it on the other person's mic a little bit. So, <laughs> so just a good reminder on those things. Just just if any of you are starting a podcast, but not about this subject because we already have it cornered. Thanks. We're joking. <laughs> cornered is, a, is in quotes considering I was – uh, <laughs> just on Seth Decker's uh, film rescue show. I, I know there's like a million of these. Like, <laughs> yeah. Still, uh, it's <laughs> it, it's well. It's the wildest part is that realizing that the crew from Film Rescue are all like my neighbors. Oh, that is crazy. <laughs> Yeah, like again, like Seth and I would like meet up. He just he just moved across the country, but the rest of them are like still all in this area. And like, uh, we like Seth and I would like meet up for coffee like around the time that they were filming um last summer, and I was a contributor on that on that movie. Uh, and it was like, oh yeah, it's it's really weird that we have like the same show, <laughs> <laughs> and like not it's not even just like live in the D.C. area, but like live like in the just north of the Beltway, like in the suburbs area. Where like the same Starbucks is like the convenient Starbucks for the two of us. Yeah, that's close. Yeah. Uh, and, and like one of the guys from the crew was like when I was recording with them last week uh, was like, oh, shit, I know Broughton. He talked to me about working on this shoot. I'm like, well, we would have worked together if you were available, like because I was <laughs> the production manager for the, the weeks that you were talking about. <laughs> Oh. So wild, wild stuff. Um, anyway, <laughs> not just to be a commercial for other people's show. So, although so, Film Rescue, great show. Go, check, you should check it out. They're 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 great. Um, Talks about everything soon. here today. Yeah, well, you know, dad brain at the moment. Um, it's okay. How is that water, by the way, that you're drinking, Sam? Is it wet? I don't know. Dad jokes. Yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, let, let, let's call it here. So listeners, uh, I know the production schedule has been kind of wonky. A lot of that has to do with me having a baby and having a hard time kind of staying on top of things. But Jeff, our our new editor, has been doing great and is getting into the, the rhythm of it. We did unfortunately saddle him with a like over three hour recording uh, for what is our next episode. <laughs> uh, but Sorry, Jeff. Uh, he assures me he's getting it down quite a bit. And I, I believe him because he is... Uh, uh, very, very fastidious when he when he edits. Um, he also does the Gamja Bar show, which is a 
just advertising everyone at this point. Uh, yeah. A great Dune podcast. And like, they, that sounds great. Anyway, next time we'll be talking about Power Rangers, the 2017 movie, um, which I'm very excited about. We've got Nick Wolf on for that one, as well as Maddie Limerick. Um, and so that one went big because it, it's hard not to when you've got Maddie Limerick and me uh, talking uh-huh. about Power Ranger stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. 100%. That's how it goes. Uh huh. Um, mm-hmm. And then next time on the bonus episodes, we're actually going to be looking at Spider Man 3. Oh, boy. Yeah. Usually uh, I love Jeff a musical back number. On. Usually I love a musical <laughs> number, but oh, Spider Man 3. Yeah, uh, we've got the next two are back to back with Jeff Moon and it's Spider-Man 3. And then the next bonus episode after that is the uh, the 2000s Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. OK, yeah. yeah, so some exciting stuff coming up there. Uh, and if you didn't check out our previous episode that just and just as in very big quotes uh, dropped, uh, which is we did Speed Racer and we had uh, Sophia Ricciardi from uh, from Movie Struck and from the uh, Overly Sarcastic podcast. She was great. That was a great episode. Uh, really happy to chat about Wachowski stuff because whatever you can say about any other movies, it's always fun. Yeah, um, always. And that was a really good. 100%. Yeah, that was a really good episode. So those are all cool ones. Uh, you should check those all out. You should check out Ed Gross's new book, Voices from Krypton, where you will see me quoted quite a bit. I was really blown away at how uh, much I was in there. Like uh, middle middle of the book, not so much, but beginning and end of the book, quite a lot. So uh, very cool stuff there. And uh, yeah, until next. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that dad brain. Um, until next time, if you enjoyed the show, pass it on. Pass it on. <laughs> Yay, Grace is sleeping. Just in time for the end. And we're back. Um, all right. So, Sam, so uh, w- this is always a time for you to give some thoughts about movies that you didn't have a chance to talk about. Hey, Grace. Hi. Hi, baby girl. Grace, would you like to give your, your thoughts on Star Trek The Motion Picture? Yeah, but so, Sam, so what are your thoughts about Star Trek The Motion Picture? And then what are your thoughts? On- Hang on. We're going to redo this because that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought I asked her. I, I can cut me. Well, she <laughs> I can cut I know she can't hear me. But, but. Yeah. But, uh, I, you know. Okay. Oh, you like this weird motion that I'm doing right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, Josue, let's go through our new comic day stack. We have a lot to review. I know. Maybe we've gone too far. Well, let's see. Marvel, of course. DC. I got Image. Dark Horse. Black Mask, Boom, IDW. Aftershock, Vault, of course. Mad Cave. Oni, Valiant, Scout. Magma, Behemoth. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, well, all we need now is a name for our show. We need a name for a show about reviewing comic books every week. Something clever, but not too clever. Like a pun? It's kind of cheesy. Yeah, it's something that seems funny at first, but we might regret later on as an impulsive decision a few dozen episodes in. Yeah, we'll think of something. Join Keith and Osway for We Have Issues, a weekly show reviewing almost every new comic released each week. Available on Geek Elite Media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. That was very good on command, baby girl. Yeah, she's a star already. Yeah. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.